Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in the program, uh, it was, this talk was introduced as uh, nowness, as the limit between, or the frontier between past and future. And I called it, well, nowness and the limits of experiencing. So you might be wondering, okay, what is the limit between past and future? And I'm sure we can all take a look at our Swiss watches and you can tell me the time and say, well, this is now, this is between what was previously and what is about to come. But how useful are your Swiss watches really in talking about nowness, in talking about the now and what we experience as the now? So this is what this talk is going to be about. I'm going to structure it as follow. So firstly, I'm going to explain to you what phenomenology is and what it does, and in particular, how it conceptualizes uh, nowness. Uh, in what follows, I will explain what neurophenomenology can add to the field of uh, phenomenology itself, present you its general methods and some examples, uh, before then going over to a brief summary of why we use this field of neurophenomenology in the context of limits. Okay, now what is phenomenology? According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and I quote, phenomenology is the study of consciousness as experienced from the first person point of view. Now, what is the first person point of view? It's the one that we all know. It's how we experience the world from a subjective point of view. So how we ourselves view the world and the objects around us. Um, it can be understood as a type of ontology because ontology is the field that asks, well, what does actually exist? And what are the particular features of the thing that exists? In that sense, phenomenology postulates the only thing that exists is our experience. However, it is very much different from metaphysics because phenomenology, while postulating that we know that experience exists, we don't know anything beyond that. We do not know the reality beyond our experience. It was founded in or launched in the early 20th century by thinkers such as Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Merleau-Ponty. What are the main assumptions that phenomenology postulates? The first, first of all, think of the verb to experience. This verb is transitive, so it means it needs an object, a direct object. You always experience something. You experience a situation, a mood, you experience the weather or your surroundings, but you don't just experience. So whenever I do experience something, I'm conscious of it, and my um, consciousness is directed towards something. Phenomenology calls this intentionality. Secondly, temporality is an intrinsic part of consciousness. I can only experience the now, and whenever I am conscious, it is in the now. There is no now unless I am conscious. So the two, the now and consciousness, are inseparably, uh, inseparably um, connected. And thirdly, there is no other way for me to experience than in the now, and this now is not a line. There is no clear-cut distinction between past and future, even though we were talking or mentioning the limit that exists. It, it is basically a continuum. The now is not a line. How can I prove that to you? Let's first think of physical time. What do we know from physics about time? Well, it is typified as an arrow of infinitesimal moments in time. And mathematics even allows for time to happen in both ways, so forwards and backwards. But the question is, do we really experience it that way? So is time for us a sequence of discrete moments that happen in a unidirectional way, in a form of an arrow? Well, let's take a look at the goldfish. The goldfish myth tells us that the goldfish is swimming in its bowl, and with every new turn, it experiences as if it were a new moment. It doesn't remember, according to the myth, the last turn, so every time it reaches the plant, it goes like, wait, that was a new turn. I haven't seen this plant before. But, well, in fact, goldfish um, remember up to several days, 
but this um, serves as an illustration to show you what our human experience is not. We do not experience every moment as a new one and do not remember the last one. So this then is how phenomenology um, illustrates or imagines the specious present or the present which it calls specious present. It consists of a core and this core is then what moves into the past once we focus our attention on what we think is the now. So this core is the orange line that you see and it's called the now, uh, what's what we call nowness. And then after it has moved into the past, it still influences our experience of the now, although it is already past. Bear with me, I'm going to explain that in a bit more detail in a second. But you can also see from the graph that something similar must be happening to the future because that would, that's what phenomenologists um, postulate. But then the question is, okay, if our present is not just a line or a point in time, and if the past influences our experience in the now, if the future experiences or, uh, influences our experience of the now, how do the three influence each other mutually? Or rather, how, are the, is, how is the experience in the now primed by something that has just happened or something that is going to happen? And secondly, how long is this thing that we perceive as now? And how can we measure its length? If we think uh, about our perception of the present, we know that we can never detain it. So it always seems to be slipping away once we have focused our attention on it. So if I snip my fingers now, then one second later, the snipping is already in the past. But when taking a closer look, um, our present or our experience does not simply consist of snippings. It's not just moments in time, but there is duration. So for example, if I lift this water bottle from here to here, I can only observe this movement of, of lifting if by the time my hand is up, I'm still keeping hold of that moment when it was further down. Otherwise, there would be no movement. And according to phenomenologists, this capacity of um, perceiving duration is what we call retention. So it's the just past that still influences um, our perception in the now before it then slips into the actual past. Careful though, retention has nothing to do with memory or the actual past. It is what we still feel is in the now, but if you have a closer look, um, let's say physically, this point in time that we are referring to is actually not in the present millisecond right now anymore. Now, if we look at the other side of this graph, you might get suspicious and think, okay, how can the future influence my present if the future is not there yet, if it has not been realized yet? Well, protention is not the future influencing our present, obviously, but it's our anticipation of it, our expectation, or as phenomenologists put it, our effect towards the future. How can we prove that? Read the following sentence. Okay. If you did not expect this ending, you were probably surprised. And if you were surprised, that means you anticipated a different ending. You anticipated a different future at the time when you were, st when you were reading the beginning of the sentence. Only that in this case, your expectation of what was going to happen did not match what actually happened. This is how surprise works. And similarly, um, our perception of whatever we read or experience is not just influenced by what we expect, but all different types of, uh, let's call them dispositions. So um, let's say whether you are tired, attentive, hungry, angry, or both, because um, if you, well, stayed for the nightcap yesterday and you went to the church this morning, you might be still very tired and you might not be caring about my sentence at all. So you might not actually be surprised at its ending. But um, otherwise, if you were attentive, you would feel that surprise because you anticipated. So similarly, if our um, experience of the now 
was not influenced by retention, so the just past, or protension, our anticipation of the future, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't feel any surprise either because our anticipation in this example of the sentence would not be influenced either by the years of language experience that we have nor by the beginning of the sentence that we used in order to anticipate its ending. Therefore, the now is extended and inseparable from its immediate past and what we expect is about to become, as well as our disposition. So this is what we assume from a phenomenological point of view. Now, as I announced earlier, I was also going to tell you what neurophenomenology can add to this question of the limit between um, past and future. Neurophenomenology as a field was founded and appropriated by um, Francisco Varela, a Chilean biologist, philosopher, and neuroscientist. And neurophenomenology reconciles phenomenology and cognitive neurosciences in that it tries to find mutual constraints that constrain both our first-person experience of the world, as well as the physiological processes that give rise to consciousness. So it reconciles what we know about our own experience, as well as what we have found out about the brain, about how the body reacts to certain stimuli or when it is conscious. So the question is, what is the neuronal correlate of present-time consciousness? How can we find correlations between what we experience and what we know about the brain? This is called a phi phenomenon. Now, if I ask you what you see, you might first say, well, a white dot moving in a circle of blue dots. But if I ask you again and you think about it, you will say, okay, probably it's eight static pictures, so pictures of blue circles where a different white circle is missing that are shown in a sequence which makes you see them as a motion. The, di uh, the distance between these um, pictures in this case is 100 milliseconds. This is why you, uh, where you can observe the motion. But what if I speed this up? What if I show this um, GIF a bit faster? The problem is, I couldn't speed it up as fast as I wanted to because the program wouldn't allow me. But what you would basically see is just a random flickering of white and blue dots. You can imagine yourselves, you cannot speed this up randomly. At some point, you won't see the, circle, the circular movement anymore. So according to Francisco Varela, we need a minimal distance of a certain amount of milliseconds in order to consciously perceive this image as a motion and not as simultaneously um, fl um, flickering images. So we need them, we need each state to last for a certain amount of duration. Similarly, we have no experience of something that only lasts for say one millisecond. This is what our experience tells us and from neurosciences, we know that information simply needs a certain amount of time to travel from the sensory level so in this case, the eye, our retina, to the visual cortex and back to where it can reach consciousness. So we cannot speed this up randomly, and this is the mutual constraint. We know from our experience that we cannot speed it up, and we know from neuroscience that information needs a certain time before it can become conscious in the brain. Now something similar happens at a higher level, you might have seen this before. This is a Necker cube. And when you look at it, at first sight, you will either see it from above or below. And if you focus enough, you will be able to see the alternative version that you did not see before. And if you focus a bit more, you can even switch between these versions. But again, try to speed this up. So try to see one version, the other, one version, the other, and speed this up as fast as you can. At some point, you will realize you cannot speed it up any, any faster. You need a certain amount of time to switch. And usually, the time that it, this takes is between some two and three seconds. 
Maybe you're able to do it in, in a bit less, but probably not much less than one second. This is our experience. And um, the time that passes between these moments, or these switching moments, is what phenomenologists refer to as acts of consciousness. So while you maintain one version of the image, this is one act of consciousness, and then you switch to the other version, which is the next. Now, from a neuroscientific point of view, we know that in order for us to think and process, our brain activates cell assemblies. So populations of neurons that are responsible for processing any particular type of information. However, here we are talking about thousands of neurons. And these do not simply spark off in one second, uh, or millisecond, and then disappear the next. It takes a certain time for all those neurons to build up and then uh, subside once the computa computation has been performed. So for neurophenomenologists, the duration of each act of consciousness, so the, the moment that we, the duration while we perceive one version of the cube, corresponds with the time that each cycle of neuronal ensembles takes to emerge, flourish, and subside. Now, the previous um, duration that I showed you, the one with the little dots, is the smallest scale that cannot be compressed any further because we need it in order to perceive duration. And this here is another scale that, we cannot, that cannot be compressed any further because it is simply the time that our brain needs in order to make this computation, in order to maintain this act of consciousness, build it up, and then change to the next one. So again, this is a constraint that we know from both our experience as well as the brain. There is a limit to speeding things up, so to say. Now, the question is, how can we measure these activities that we keep talking about and the neurons and what the neurons do in our brain? Well, we can measure real-time activity of the brain in the electroencephalogram, short EEG, because whenever your brain processes something, the neurons in your brain create an electric potential which we can then record with electrodes that we place um, on the scalp. Now, the activity that we, we measure can simply be additive, so more neurons firing at the same time, or it can be oscillatory. And brain oscillations are the synchronized activity of a large number of neurons that follow oscillatory feedback loops. So, in the, in the upper image, you see a general um, EEG recording, and in the lower one, you see just one electrode and the activity recorded therein. So you can see in the first one and a half seconds, you had just random brain activity that is then followed by another one and a half um, seconds of clear oscillatory um, activity. So you can see the nice sine waves um, that usually, or that always appear in a certain frequency, in this case about 10 hertz, so it's 10 spikes per second. Afterwards, it goes back to a random activity. So that's how a brain oscillation looks. You will see in a bit why this is relevant to, to our question here. Um, and these oscillations can either be in one area of the brain, it can be in two, or it can be in wide distributed networks all over the brain. Meaning that the neurons in these regions oscillate in the same frequency even though they are not adjacent to each other. Okay. Now, I said that two regions can oscillate in the same frequency, but that does not mean that they need to be synchronous. So, even though they have, let's say, both a frequency of 10 hertz, their phase can be different, so they set off at a different time. When they are synchronous, that means that their spikes correspond, as in this case. Here you see the spikes between um, the two oscillations correlate, whereas here they do not really. So the distances between spikes and um, valleys are uh, different. Here we speak of no phase uh, synchronization. Now, why do we need all this in order to explain consciousness? I'll give you another example that we can do together. So up here we have a picture, and I can ask you 
to look at the red face. And you will all be able to do it. And now I can tell you, look at the greenhouse. And I assume you also will be able to do it. But even though the picture remains exactly the same, we perceive different things when, when, the, when our attention is different. And this type of task is called binocular rivalry because we can see two things depending on our attention. Now, Tong and colleagues in 1998 conducted one of the earliest studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging, so fMRI, um, to measure conscious perception. And they found that when people were focusing on the face, the region on the left-hand side was active, so the fusiform face area, whereas when they fo were focusing on the house, this region was active. Um, yeah, the, the, I won't mention the term here because it doesn't, it's not relevant, but what you see is that two different regions are active depending on um, what stimulus you're focusing on, so which image you're focusing on. So even though the object that we perceive has not changed, the body's interaction with it has, right? Because our body seems to be reacting differently depending on its attention. So this is what we know from the brain. This is what the brain does to categorize an image or a stimulus that it gets. But that does not explain how it reaches our consciousness. So we know that these regions are active, so there is neuronal activity, but how does it get from there to our consciousness? And this is what we need the phase synchrony for that I explained earlier. So the oscillations that happen in the same frequency. Because um, what we know from neurosciences is that changes in the synchrony that I showed you earlier do not only happen when we look at, um, when we focus our attention on different things, but during different aspects of um, consciousness. So for example, during arousal or during uh, sensimotor integration, perception and working memory. Therefore, it is postulated, and I quote, that neural synchronization is a valuable physiological candidate for the emergence and the flow of cognitive phenomenal states. Basically, the idea being we are conscious because our brain is able to oscillate synchronously. Now, that sounds pretty easy. If we, if we know that, okay, when we shift our attention to something, our brain will start oscillating in a, in a phase synchronously, then, okay, then we have solved the riddle. But is that really the case? The problem is, even though we have been able to explain aspects of consciousness, to date, no neuronal uh, correlate has been found to produce a plausible explanation for what we experience as this private and subjective consciousness that we would all argue we have. So often, this neuronal synchrony explains snapshots. Um, so it explains moments of becoming aware of something, but it's usually not maintained during a longer um, perceptive um, process. And in that sense, it does not explain the flow of consciousness or the stream of consciousness that we all associate with because it defines our personality. It's the stream that ranges from our early childhood until the present and that we call our identity. Yeah. So this is now where we come full circle on the topic of limits because we know and agree that consciousness exists, we are still not able to determine the neurophysiological processes that are responsible for it. So how do we actually become conscious and how are we conscious throughout our whole life? Now, the problem here and another limit is how are we going to analyze consciousness if we have to be conscious in order to analyze it? So there is no analytical place outside of consciousness that we could assume. 
And there are other ways that um, neurophenomenology addresses the issue of limits. Firstly, as we already mentioned at the beginning, it explores the limit between past and future. And how can we describe this limit that we call the now or the present? Where can we put it and how does it arise? How long does it last? And how can we measure it? So there are a lot of unanswered questions about this very vague limit. And secondly, neurophenomenology also points out the limits of the human mind. Because if our experience is always tainted by the past and the just past, as well as our expectation or anticipation towards the future, and if it is never passive, but always directed to something, then that means that it's always partial and restricted. Likewise, our perception is always limited by our physiology. We can only perceive what our body and brain are able to process. So for example, if our retinas are not able to register infrared light, we have no conscious experience of, of infrared light unless we develop machines that will take this over for us. So we do not register the world as it is. We only register what our bodies are able to make us register. Thirdly, as I mentioned earlier, no neuronal correlate has been found to date that explains consciousness holistically. We are able to explain parts of it by neuronal synchrony, but that is it. So we do not know how our stream of consciousness is made up from a neuronal or from a neurophysiological point of view. And then fourthly, neurophenomenology crosses the boundary between phenomenology as a field of philosophy and natural sciences um, through neurosciences. It establishes anchor points that can be addressed from both perspectives, and by doing so, we can gain a more holistic understanding of the human experience. Finally, by doing so, by reconciling these two fields, neurophenomenology has also found itself forced to bridge the gap between first-person perspective of phenomenology and the third-person perspective of neurosciences. So how do we reconcile what we know about our own experience, what happens introspectively, with what we can measure in other people, say, via their behavior, via neuronal processes that we can measure? And all of these aspects make neurophenomenology a prime example of science at the limits that leaves much yet, much yet to explore. And I would like to conclude this presentation with a quote by Ellen W. Watts. I have realized that the past and future are real illusions, that they exist in the present, and which is what there is and all there is. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, Maria. Uh, we have time for questions, for commentaries, whatever. Yes, please, last, last row. Hi, we met yesterday already. So um, my name is Juan Ashteopan. I've been a student at the uh, last Academy at Engelberg. And um, I can actually really congratulate you. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, my question would be if you can put back the image or not <laughs> um, with the picture of the past, the nowness, and the future. That one? Yeah. For me, I didn't really get why there isn't a line between the past and the future. Doesn't the past somehow influence your future, even if you don't look at the nowness itself. Because yes. now you said, you said uh, the nowness and the past and the nowness and the future. Isn't there a relationship without the past and the future? Yes, but that happens on a different level. So of course, well, if you want to, to say the past as a, the, all the circumstances that happen in the past influence all the circumstances that will be in the future. Yes, of course. But this is, does not describe 
what happens externally and what causes what, but only how our experience of time, of temporality, is shaped. And in, in our experience, there is no future. We are never in the future. We are always here. We cannot go back. We can form images of what was earlier, and we can form images of what we think will happen. But here we are not talking about the actual past and the actual future, but its representations in our mind. And in that sense, the only link that there is between these two is in our present time consciousness. Uh, Bill Bittinger speaking. Perhaps one word that would be useful here to pick up on your point um, uh, to challenge your final quote, that it's only the now, neither the past nor the future, is the concept of memory and its relationship to consciousness. I realize that's a separate lecture, but it seems to me it's germane to what we're talking about now. Is, what is the question, whether it's related to? Memory and consciousness, that relationship is integral to the relationship between now and the past as it informs our future. Well, yes, there is a relationship, of course, because whatever happens in your past will influence or prime immediately what you will experience in the, in the present. But as I said, there is a difference between what we call these slipping moments in the nowness that move on into the past and memory. So, of, of course, memory um, is always a representation of something. It's, um, it's, it's like a duplicate image of something that we form, of something that we experienced or believe we experienced. But it's very much different from the now because it's always reconstructed. So there is a past-like aspect in the now which we keep hold of in order to form our general image of the present. But memory acts from a different, from a much broader and much, much wider um, sort of angle in that it still influences every moment that we experience because we cannot act independently from our past. But yeah, that's, that's how I would put it. You know, the phenomenologist is, is in a sense a very radical psychologist because the phenomenologist would say, uh, we never have access to our memories directly as something that's stored in the past. We only have access to it by recalling it in the now. And that's where he, where, that's his starting point. So I think it, it would be a very interesting question to reconcile uh, uh, psychological, you know, the science of memory within standard psychology with the phenomenological approach. It's, it's as you say yourself, it's a long story, of course. Thank you. Gerd, no. Yes, Gerd was, was next. Gerd Volkes, um, thank you very much for this excellent lecture, absolutely. Um, you emphasize the synchronization effects. And now I ask myself uh, that I understand this uh, mathematical concept of synchronization perfectly. Uh, then I, I also doubt if I look at, at biology. So getting neurons uh, synchronized, uh, you have to do with uh, some uh, phew, uh, dirty behavior of biological systems uh, in, in terms of precision and, and, and interaction. So is something known what the degree of identity or similarity uh, is needed to, uh, to fall in this uh, synchronization mode and, and synchronization condition. So as in how strong the correlations would have to be between For example, the new? Yeah. Well, the way I would put it is that you simply measure the strength of the frequency band. So what you do with, with um, the brain activity is you analyze the different frequencies that are contained therein, and then you can analyze from the different electrodes what are the frequency of that particular electrode, which again gives me some kind of idea of what's happening beneath. And then I need to correlate the phases between those uh, different frequencies, which I'm not pr I'm exactly sure how to do, but basically it's, it's correlating frequencies at different electrodes and thereby arguing if they oscillate in the same frequency, their activity must be associated. So would you, would you think this is uh, tissue dependent? So it's for brain, it's a more uh, uh, peculiar thing than for heart cells. So if I put heart cells under a microscope, I mean, I can, uh, if, the, if the, uh, the number of cells is large enough, they start oscillating in synchronization like that without doing anything. So, uh, 
Is that a primitive or a very intelligent mechanism that is behind that? Good question. Actually, I don't know how brain tissue is different from, from heart tissue and in question of oscillating. Actually, the first studies of these synchronization effects have been done by Wolf Singer and his group and, and Eckhorn also in Marburg. And they didn't do it with humans, they did it with cats. Yes. <laughs> and by the way, there's one, one other interesting piece of information which you might want to know. Uh, the, the synchronization is actually almost always around 30 hertz, which means, this, in terms of time scales, this is uh, 30 milliseconds, more or less. And that's also another, as you said before, this is an interesting, a very, very low time scale for nowness. For? For nowness, for the yeah. present. It's on a different scale, of course. It's not two or three seconds. It's the 30 hertz is 30 milliseconds. But it, it also adds another dimension of, of um, well, mathematical problems, because 30 hertz is also very similar to the frequency of muscular activity. So we have a lot of that in, in any EEG recording. And whenever we filter it out, the question is always what we, what we keep there and call it um, well, synchrony or, or consciousness synchrony, is that really what we think we measure or is it just muscular activity? Yes, please, another question. Thank you. My name is Axel Haunschild from the University of Hanover in Germany. Another th big thank you from me for your fantastic presentation. I think this could be made even more complicated when you look at Niklas Luhmann, for example, who followed up on Varela, looking at social phenomena. He says there are nine different times. So there is a past future, a present future, and a future in the future, and you can go through all of them. There's a future past, and a, a, a past from, from now, and a past past. Okay. So for example, when societies look at themselves, they have, we do, do history, for example, then we look in the past, what people thought of the past in the past. Uh, so you focus on the individual and, and individual consci consciousness, but you can also transfer this through societal phenomena and what our Im images of the future are uh, in our society, for example. So when we talk about visions in the future or so, and these are different from the visions we had in the past. Mm -hmm. I think this cannot be explained by neuroscience then. So you need cultural approaches to, to study that. Mm -hmm would be my thesis. I don't know whether you agree on that. Yeah, the problem is that everything that you analyze on a larger scale, so as in whole areas or whole epochs in, in, in history, they are very different to analyze with, neuro, um, with neuroscientific methods because you can usually always measure very short amounts of time. So it would be difficult to correlate um, yeah, behavior on such a large scale, I would say. But um, yeah, to your question about um, societies acting according to this knowledge that we can influence or anticipate future um, events, we were talking about this in, in the summer school, that if we are aware or if we know what is going to happen, why is it so difficult to adapt our behavior? And we were talking about that um, in the context of in environmental issues. So we are all very much aware that driving cars and using up all the CO2 is very um, damaging to our environment. And still, why is there such a, let's say, clear boundary between what we know we should do and what is going to happen and actually changing our behavior in the present time? I think there is a very interesting, uh, maybe even bigger question behind what you're asking, and that's the question of how we understand the relationship between let's say, a social system and its individual constituents, if you want, right? Yeah, and there's a long tradition in the sciences uh, where people thought that every ensemble of constituents has to be ultimately understood by the behavior of the individual constituents. It's called the reductive approach. And that has been very much under fire recently. You know, more and more people seem to think that uh, you can have emergent properties which are not predefined by the individual constituents, but arise at the ensemble level, at the, in that case at the social level, without being predictable from the individuals. So I'm only mentioning that because uh, it's still not finally resolved how this relationship actually works. 
And it may work differently for different systems, which, makes, which doesn't make it uh, easier, of course, right? <laughs> but that's another thing which has to be considered in the background. Gerd, yes. Just a comment for, uh, further on that. I mean, that's a very important question. That is, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it uh, is brought up here. I mean, we have the whole field of design thinking that, uh, in principle, goes along the, uh, uh, the, the, the deep conviction that uh, by a certain number of processes that I know before, I can end up with a definite, uh, definite mm -hmm. result. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this is in, in fundamental contradiction to the, to the emerging effects of yes. uh, let me say graphene, or what we never would have expected uh, from, from, from either mathematics or, or, or physics. Yes, thanks. Any further questions? Um, then let me go on with another one. Your final quote was Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. And Alan Watts was uh, a student of Suzuki, I think, in, Calif in the California tradition of Zen Buddhism, so um, I suspect that you didn't, you didn't choose this quotation by such a person uh, by accident. Um, in the context of religion, you mean? Yeah, or maybe meditation techniques, you know, because um, there's also some literature around where you can see that uh, using certain meditation techniques, there are many of them, of course, you can also play around with the extension of, uh, with the duration of, of what, what we call nowness today, right? You can extend it, you can shrink it. And so that was my suspicion in the background, no? Not, no? not explicitly, no. No. But, um, yeah, of course, also, that we, we mentioned that in the discussion of um, the flow experience as well, mm -hmm. that um, these processes are far from, from being automatic, so the oscillations that we observe mm -hmm. They can be manipulated, and actually they are. That is what, what we use uh, neurofeedback for, for example. So you can actually feed a person their own activity back in form of images and then ask them to man manipulate it. And they can do so by simply focusing or relaxing or sort of by a, by a mental effort to change that activity. And meditation is one of these processes um, or of these activities where we can actually achieve quite a noticeable uh, manipulation of our brain activity and can then again make make statements about how our perception has changed in that moment based on the, the differences in, in activity that we observe. When I think of things like that which, which for me are uh, very complicated and really respect that you had to do, wanted to do this, um, a question that comes to mind did you somewhere in your research for this presentation find something about the explanation of a déjà vu? Because that's, that's something you experience in the now, but you're pretty sure you experienced in the past while not being sure you experienced in the past. I think it's... Well, I haven't read anything in my research on this particular presentation, but I read about it before. And um, it's, it's basically our brains cheating on us, as far as I understand, because there's a delay in processing. So let me, let me put it correctly, but I think the image reaches consciousness before the categorization of it um, reaches consciousness. So it's, it's like a delay in the image and its representation, or it's, it's putting it into context in the present. So I think it's, it's some kind of bug in our perception, but they say they figured it out and there is no such thing as deja vu that we have experienced and re-experience again. Am I right? Yeah, deja, deja vu is not finally understood yet. This is exactly one of the possible interpretations of it. Another one is in terms of false memories, which is to say that when you learn something, uh, what what usually happens is that the, the landscape of your established categories changes, right? Because you learn something new. And as a byproduct of learning something new, additional little categories may arise which have never been experienced just by the, by the structure of the landscape. And then if, you are, if, you are, if your mental state, so to speak, comes close to that false memory category in perception or whatever, 
then uh, the mental state somehow goes into that false memory and you feel as if it's already there. So you feel as if it is remembered, but it has never been experienced. So this is another kind of approach. Uh, um, maybe there are, there are more, I don't know. Please. Thanks for the question. That's good. I have a similar question about dreams as a different kind of consciousness. Uh, are, do you know if there have been done uh, EEG experiments on measurements and looked for synchronizations during sleeping, during dreams? But you already said that these experiments were all done in cats so not, far. Oh, not so always. No, I was saying the first experiments. Ah, the, first, yeah, yeah. the first ones were, do, were done in animals, but now we have many, many of these studies done in humans are as well. Are dreams some sort of nowness or? That's a good question. The problem is you, you can't time it in any way. You mm -hmm. cannot set a stimulus and say, okay, now he was dreaming of a cat because there's no one to press a button and say I was dreaming of a cat. So the problem is you can measure different activity and probably, I, I assume this has been done, associate with different um, sleeping states. And these sleeping states, again, are associated with, with the fact whether or not um, somebody has been dreaming, and then I assume in hindsight you can then ask the person, okay, was it a pleasant dream or not? And then you can correlate that. But you cannot correlate anything mm -hmm. more precise than, than general statements that you make after waking up. Also, it's where it, it is known from uh, dream reports that the usual temporal structure that we experience in our wakeful state is often very distorted. Mm -hmm. So it's not always clear that there is a kind of thing that happens and then something else happens as an effect of it in the future. So there's much of much to start. And, and if you really, um, I think there's a very, very good book, very recent, on dream research by Jennifer Wint. It's, I think the title is simply Dreaming. It's, it's just one or two years old, MIT Press. It's a good book. Anybody else? <laughs> Yes, me again. Um, about the dreaming, a lot of people, for example, dream that they are falling from a step. And then they, they do like, like dogs do in their sleep with the legs, so they, they try to... That, that might be a dream where you can actually say you don't need to push a button, but you can notice from the movement of the person that they're dreaming that they're falling from a step. So is, is that some type of consciousness when you... You don't really know you're sleeping, so you try, so your whole body actually tries to stop you from falling, although you're not falling. I think it's an intermediate state where you're, mm. where you're still dreaming, so you're not conscious, but your body in a way is already becoming conscious, so trying to avoid what, what you're dreaming about. But then, um, in order to measure it, you would have to have a precise movement that you can categorize it, okay, this movement is only done in dreams of falling. And I'm not sure if, if, if it's that specific, because otherwise it, be, it could be any, um, let's say, dream in motion, right, where, where I'm walking or running or, or just falling. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't know whether you can correlate it that easily and say, okay, this must be this dream, so right now he must be dreaming that. It could also be random muscular activity, like some twitching. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think the, the, at least in the philosophy of mind, there is a kind of taxonomy of different kind of uh, states of different, let's say, conscious intensity or something like that, with, between uh, the usual wakeful state and um, let's say coma. And there is, I mean, dream, dream consciousness is one. Then another interesting one, I think, is hypnos states of hypnosis. And in states of hypno hypnosis, you can really trigger things right on the time. So that might be another interesting um, kind of area where you, where you might be able to study really time dependencies also. Because, that, I mean, hypnosis actually depends on on inducing something right on the time. So that might be an additional thing. This, 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 this whole area is um, very unexplored, and there's so much to do, and, and if there are people 
here in, in the room who still haven't decided yet what to do in their professional life. I can only strongly encourage you to go into this area. There's, there's a lot coming up. <laughs> So, any other question? Yes, please. Something very time-focused, time mm -hmm. future, present, past. There are other approaches, like uh, information-focused. Mm -hmm. And have you uh, also looked at uh, things like uh, general information theory by Tononi, uh, that talks about consciousness, to the point where you also can discuss if, for instance, a device, a handy or something like this can have consciousness. Oh, I think that that's the topic for the, for the next presentation, artificial intelligence. And, and, and I'm happy well, to, to pass the question on because um, I don't know in, in, in the context of the information theory. But what, what has led you to... Uh, be time-centric instead of information-centric in your work? Because that is the, the, the absolute core of phenomenology and neurophenomenology. It is all about present time consciousness because we cannot separate the two. So we cannot objectively talk about um, information without taking into consideration that it always is processed at a particular time, influenced by different sort of, let's call them um, levels in time as well, or dimensions. So um, basically, firstly, for, for time issues, I wasn't focusing on, on any other topics, and also because temporality is simply what it is all about in phenomenology. OK, thank you. So if you want to blame someone for the topic and for the focus, this is me. 